what is the role of consciousness in human evolution? Was it our genes improving the species survival or did it appear randomly? Seems like it helped the rise of civilizations, but it also introduced many self-harming behaviors for the individual. Uh, so we, this is something that we have talked about and written about um, extensively. The writing, writing about it is not yet out there in the world. Um, it's in the book that will be coming out this year. Um, but among other places, you, I think you've talked about it a number of places. Yep. Um, but we talked about it in the talk that we were supposed to give in person at Princeton last April or May. And of course, I had to give over Zoom. But that means the upside of that is that I think it's still available. I think so, too. Um, so if you if you Google up Princeton and our two names, maybe it'll come up in consciousness. Maybe it'll come up. Or, um, but uh, since we're James still affiliated Madison with... No, but since we're still fellows there, it might that might not be sufficient. But uh, Robbie George was our interlocutor interlocutor yeah but he's also the anyway. right but nonetheless if you google those names it's likely to come up especially if you hit video on the search but true um anyway i would say i have noticed that consciousness is the topic that is most likely to turn uh, to turn um careful thinking people into spouters of gobbledygook and i uh, this has begun to be a, the most. That's the, quite something. The number one, I would say, that there is something about this topic which causes otherwise logical people to start saying the most amazingly ridiculous things. So, consciousness can't have been an accident. I think was your term there. Um, um, no, it says, was it our genes improving the species survival, or did it appear randomly? So, okay, so did it appear randomly? The answer is all of the components that make it possible have to have appeared. Ultimately, there has to be a random layer at Ultimately the bottom. back in time. Yeah. But mm -hmm. uh, the fact is consciousness is hugely goddamn expensive, right? And complex. Complex and prone to error, right? So what that says, all of those facts tell you this was massively useful to the species because all of those downsides that it has to overcome wouldn't... Uh, have allowed it to uh, to be augmented if it didn't have this tremendous benefit. So the real question is how? And I don't think we want to get too bogged down here, but I will say I believe the reason that we don't understand consciousness, that is to say that we don't have agreement on what it means, is that we have misunderstood it as an individual level phenomenon, which is very hard to explain. And what Heather and I do that's different is we regard it as most likely a collective phenomenon first, and then individual com uh, consciousness is an epiphenomenon of collective consciousness. And the problem is, because you can stick a person in a scanner and have them experience conscious thoughts and figure out what parts of the brain light up, right? There's a bias toward studying it as an individual phenomenon, which leaves lots of paradoxes. And so the upshot of this is there is a hidden assumption the assumption is that thing which is so compelling, right, individual consciousness, we all know that that exists because we experience it, but we don't know that there's a consciousness that exists between us because we can't tap into it directly, um, that that bias in the direction of individual consciousness causes nothing to add up simply, and because it doesn't add up simply, people start grasping at ever more ridiculous straws like the particles themselves are conscious and we're just tuning into it and all sorts of other nonsense. Yeah, so the bias exists, just to rephrase what you just said, the bias exists, uh, you're arguing, we are arguing, um, in large part, perhaps, perhaps in entire part, because it is easier to measure things at the individual level than at the interaction level, than at the than at the uh, shared level, and yet we know that there are other examples of things which only make sense in terms of what is the combinatorial effect. So you know, language, and just even you know, just not humans, um, but communication. You know, communication requires both a signaler and a receiver. You can't talk about the evolution of communication or any of the communicative strategies that we talk about over in our neck of the woods, evolutionary ecology space and such, um, absent there being both a signaler and a receiver. And it doesn't have to be conscious, doesn't even have to be intentional by some people's uh, definitions of communication, but it requires those two things, those two individuals, sometimes they're not even of the same species. Um, but you don't have communication if there's just one evolved in organism. And so this argument is actually not so 
so out in left field as it might seem, because there are things that we know require more than one individual to understand them from an evolutionary perspective. This is a great way of conveying this, I think. Um, yeah, I'm not sure actually, I, I know we haven't done that in the book, but I think it actually, that this analogy works. I think it works. Yeah. And part of why it works is it's news to nobody that speech is not about the speaker, right? right? Because we all are the listener also. And so because we can tune in on both of those things, nobody's confused about this. Mm -hmm. The thing about consciousness is if you say consciousness, the purpose of it is actually for me to say, um, you know, uh, you know, what if we took, um, you know, the sail from a windsurfer and put it on a large skateboard, right? That's an idea that I can convey just by vibrating the air molecules between us. And there's a good chance that if I had you say, if I said, okay, now can you sketch what I just said, you could sketch it out and we would know that I had successfully conveyed this abstract idea mm -hmm. right between us. So the point is, um, the language is obviously an emergent phenomenon. Consciousness stands every chance of being an emergent phenomenon, but we only have the one side of it, right? So um, because of that, the bias, to, you know, in other words, mm -hmm. I know that you probably have a picture in your head of a windsurfer sail on a skateboard because I intended to put it there and you and I share a language and so it's possible to do that. Mm -hmm. I can look at my picture of that thing. I can't see your picture of that thing until you put it on paper. Mm -hmm. So the point is the asymmetry here. Or I could use language right back at you. You could, mm -hmm. right. But um, the, the asymmetry between the personal experience of consciousness and the inference that we have about somebody else's consciousness is so different that it's unlike language, um, right? You know, you and I mm -hmm. speak English approximately equally well, mm -hmm. and batting stuff back and forth is a very simple process. But, you know, to be honest, you know, look at the dog. How conscious is the dog? It's very hard to know, right? I have the sense that the dog is substantially more conscious than the cat's. I don't mean smarter, but more conscious. But it's very hard to establish that that's the case because, you know, we can't play that game. We can't tell her things and have her draw them or anything like that. Um, so She would love to play that game with oh, us. Oh, she would love to play any game that mm -hmm. we wanted her to play. That's mm -hmm. the nature of the dog. Yeah. All okay. right. So anyway, uh, yeah, I think that's a, that's a good way of pointing it out. The emergent thing is the thing. And, you mm -hmm. know, imagine the absurdity of trying to figure out what language was for if all you did was look at people speaking, right? If you didn't understand that there was a listener, yeah. like, well, what is the point of that behavior? Seems mm -hmm. And yet, I mean, God, we obviously could and have in the past and presumably will spend lots and lots more time on this, but I'm reminded actually of sort of, you know, one of the exceptions that kind of proves the rule of what you're saying. I, I recall a conversation in a class I was teaching years ago with a linguist and it was a class called The Evolution of Communication. It was a two-quarter program in which I was mostly talking about non-human communication, and she was mostly talking about language. But um, we, of course, were, were interleaving. And it was a seminar with both, both sections. And somehow we got on the subject of uh, catcalls. And um, one of the young women in the class said, you know, I just don't, I just do not get it. Like, how often does that work? Like, how often does a dude make an obnoxious sound at you on the street, get you going home with him. Like, I don't know of anyone who would ever, who would ever respond this way. And, um, another student, um, I'm just, I'm not going to name him. Um, but, but do you know, you know who it is? Um, said, I think completely correctly. And he said it, I'm glad he did exactly before I was going to say it. He said, yeah, but often, and this is not someone who would ever cat call anyone. I just, I just know this for sure. He said, <laughs> Often the catcalls aren't for the woman. That's not who's being communicated with. The dude who's catcalling on like a construction site or something is often communicating with the other dudes. Like that's who the communication is for. It's not actually about uh, the successful completion of a sexual encounter as a result of a gross move on the street that makes a woman feel less safe, right? It's about um, still, you know, inappropriate and we all, we all. I hope all of us, you know, wish it wasn't happening, um, but it's about a way of establishing rank between the men. Yeah. Um, in that case, I also wonder if there's not just a distortion that comes from the big anonymous society and if the cat call yeah. would be toned way down in mm -hmm. a normal, you know, township. And yeah. Well, one of the other guys on the crew would be like, that's my sister. <laughs> yeah. Right. Don't exactly. do that. Yeah. Um, 
I just wanted to add one last thing. Mm -hmm. It occurs to me that there's actually a hint of this failure to grok based on seeing only one side of the interaction mm -hmm. in the history of the study of echolocation. So yeah, you'll, you'll remember, because we've, we've talked about it before, that echolocation was first understood in animals when Griffin, Don Griffin, accidentally, he was an undergraduate at Harvard at the time, and he accidentally went to talk to a physicist and he put a cage full of bats down on the desk and it went, uh, the ultrasonic detector went crazy there because the bats were echolocating and he put two and two together. But hundreds of years earlier, an Italian guy who I think That's is, the kind of serendipity that could never happen now. You don't you don't just walk into a physicist's office and, with a cage full of bats as an undergraduate. Right. And I mean, happen. it was a whole different era and yeah. Don Griffin's a great guy and it was a really wonderful story. The right guy made the discovery anyway. He's a super intelligent and has contributed a great deal since then. But anyway, the a couple hundred years earlier, I believe, a, an Italian guy named Spallanzani, I think. Zini, maybe? Anyway. In any case, yeah. he was a naturalist who was trying to figure out how uh, bats navigate in the dark, and he got close, right? He ran some experiments, and he demonstrated that it was their ears, not their eyes, and he did that by doing things like plugging their ears, and... Um, he found actually the bats, if you plugged both ears, they actually, I think, did okay. And mm -hmm. if you plugged one ear, they didn't, right? And the uh, the way he tested whether or not they were able to find their way in the dark was by measuring their weight, right? So he would plug their ears and then recapture them and see if they'd lost weight, the idea being if, you know. So anyway, he did that. And then so he's got all the pieces of the puzzle. They were navigating yeah. with their ears somehow, but he wrongly concludes that what must be going on is that objects make noise and the bats are tuning into it, right? And so the point is he's got the one side of the thing, but he can't see that, oh, there, so that the bat is emitting sounds that he can't hear. Yeah, that's right? so good. So incidentally, you were right. It's Lazaro Spanzani, um, lived good. in the 1700s, yep. died in 1799. So anyway, I think it's a, it's a perfect indicator of how you can go wrong because you're only seeing half the interaction and that the real thing is the emergent space between and that that's what's going that's on great. with consciousness yeah yeah that's that's good we should we should remember this yes <laughs> it'd be great if we should record it and then i don't know you can put it into the world and yeah people okay. can remind us excellent